All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to the Acts, the Apostles, Acts chapter 2. And I'd like to read from verse 1 down to verse 13. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse, verse 1 to verse 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. We pray to thee. Our Father, would you send your Holy Spirit in a fresh new way to empower us and teach us and guide us to glean from this passage those things that have been written about him. We ask that even as we do that, we would go one step further and ask, what does this mean for us today? For me, in my life, what does it mean? So Lord, you take over. You be our teacher this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of the few passages that surface when we come to the day of Pentecost, it, which the church celebrates today. Today is the day of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the resurrection. And uh, it's a day that we celebrate the birth of the church because the church was birthed on, on this day. But the day of Pentecost was not a day that was remembered for the birth of the church when it happened. The Pentecost was something else. Pentecost had to do with the, the Feast of Weeks, which was the feast that Jews from all over, everywhere, congregated in Jerusalem and began to worship God and thank Him for the wheat harvest that had just begun. And so the priests would take two loaves of bread, wheat bread, and then they would give it to the Lord as an offering, being what was then the Feast of Wheat. And it came after the Feast of First Fruits, which was the, the barley harvest. And uh, that came after the Passover. And when you look at this, these three feasts, we see that Jesus kind of superimposed himself in a strange way upon all of these three priests. From the Passover to the Feast of Weeks. The Passover which was held when he was crucified. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist said about him. The Lamb of God. And he gave himself as the Passover Lamb. And then the first fruits, which was the resurrection. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I would encourage you to just turn with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul kind of puts that in perspective for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. 
for each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. And so Jesus, his resurrection came on the feast of first fruits. And then the feast of weeks of the harvest, the wheat harvest, which we celebrate as Pentecost. And so everybody was in Jerusalem for this feast, all over the place. And as they reached there, there was a noise like rushing wind. Noise. There wasn't wind. There was just a noise of rushing wind that filled the room. And then tongues of fire, tongues of fire settled on every one of those disciples. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So the Spirit just said, this tongue, that tongue, that language, that language. And they were all speaking in different languages. The Bible tells us that there were almost 16, 15 geographical locations that were represented at that time. Just everybody speaking from those 15 different locations, speaking in tongues that the people from that location understood. But they didn't. They had no idea what they were talking about. And it tells us that the people were amazed and astonished. Why? Because they said, these are Galileans. What do you expect from Galilee? They won't know the other languages. They are not intellectual kinds of people. How are they speaking in our language? And then they ask the question, how then do we hear them in our native languages and speaking the mighty deeds of God? All of them in different languages, but speaking the mighty deeds of God. And I think that's always what the Holy Spirit does, isn't it? He draws our attention and then takes it to God always draws our attention, takes it back, brings back to us truths about what Jesus had said so that they help us along this journey. And then there were two responses. Some of them were amazed and perplexed and asked the question, what does this mean? And others mocked and said, well, they're just full of sweet wine. Amazed and perplexed. And others, no, they're just full of wine. What can we learn beloved, from something like this? Because so often we look at the, uh, this passage and we pray for a Pentecostal uh, kind of uh, fall of the Spirit on us at times. And we ask, can I have that? And I like what Dr. Warren, the late Dr. Warren Beersby said in his commentary. He said, we must not conclude that this 10 day prayer meeting brought about the miracles of Pentecost. All that we today may pray as they did and experience another Pentecost. Like our Lord's death at Calvary, Pentecost was a once for all event that will not be repeated. The church may experience new fillings of the spirit and certainly patient prayer is an essential element to spiritual power. But we could not, would not ask for another Pentecost any more than we could ask for another Calvary. So what do we make of this passage? How do we take it and apply it to our hearts? What is God saying to us this morning? I think there are a couple of things that he wants us to land on. The first is the change in the function and use of the Holy Spirit. There are two things that happened. The first was this that the Holy Spirit came to dwell in people. The Holy Spirit came to dwell within people. Till that time, till that time, if you read the passage of scripture about the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and they spoke words that God was giving them. Verbatim, the Holy Spirit came. For the first time, the Holy Spirit is now indwelling people. Secondly, the presence of the Spirit moved from just being temporal to permanent. From temporal to permanent. Now the presence of the Holy Spirit in us is permanent. Once we have the Spirit of God within us, and we know that when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives, God gives us His Holy Spirit. His Spirit indwells us, and it's permanent. Look at John 14, 16, and 17, and again, this will be a good passage of Scripture. Just look that the next time you wonder about this, 
You can go back to this passage. John chapter 14. Verse 16. John 14. Verse 16. And Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot perceive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be with you. Abides with you and will be with you. So the spirit of God began to indwell his people and the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, became a permanent resident in our lives. That's why when you look at Psalm 51, you hear David crying out and saying, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because the spirit of God came upon people in the Old Testament. But for you and me who know and have the spirit of God within us, the spirit of God stays within us. It's a permanent present. We had a, just a wonderful dear friend, Dr. J.D. Siemens. And we were in seminary in Kentucky. And he would say, the Holy Spirit is always a permanent resident in your life. But the question is, is he the president of your life? Because it is one thing to have the Holy Spirit within you. It is entirely another thing to give the Holy Spirit access to you. That's why in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, we see Jesus, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, let him open the door and come and sup with him. Revelation 3.20 Who is Jesus speaking to? The church at Laodicea. And we need to ask the question, what is Jesus doing outside the church? It's because we give access. The Spirit of God, beloved, is resident in us. But the question is, have we given Him the entire key punch to every room in our hearts and in our lives? He is a permanent resident. But does He have control in our lives? So two changes that came from the day of Pentecost for us. So what does that mean for us today? What does the Holy Spirit bring to the equation? How do we allow this opening of our lives to Him? I want to just share with you a couple of things that comes as the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us as disciples and believers of Jesus Christ. The first one is this. He bears witness. He bears witness. Second, He teaches us. Third, He gives joy to us. He gives discernment. We bear fruit. He gives us gifts. And the list doesn't stop there. He regenerates us. He indwells us. He anoints us. He baptizes us. He guides us. And He empowers us. And sanctifies us. We look at that and we think, how many of those functions can we take off? And say, that's happening in my life. All of these things. This is what the Holy Spirit brings to man. And all of this is taken from Scripture. We need to ask ourselves, how much of our lives does He actually have control over? So let's just look at maybe a few of these areas. First one, He bears witness. He bears witness. Romans 8, 16. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Have you taken, has that relationship that you have with Jesus taken a meeting? From say, have you ever had questions that come to you and say, is God really my father? Am I his child? And yet that's why Satan would attack us, isn't it? Love? And say, no, no, he's not your, your father. And all we need to do is turn to scripture and look at it and know that that's the job of the Spirit of God, to continue to affirm 
that we are God's children. Secondly, he's our teacher. John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Beloved, the, the process we need to use when we read scripture, go Bible study, is before we start we have to say, Holy Spirit, would you help me understand this? Because that's his job, that's his function. To be able to take these precious words and open them and amplify them, illuminate our hearts, meaning, and allow us to let follow him. He's our teacher. And he's willing to teach each one of us as we look at scriptures and say, what does this mean for me? God's holy book. Even so that we can walk through, navigate in life. And he is our teacher. Thirdly, he gives joy, beloved. He gives joy. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace.
in and of myself, I cannot.
What do I do to be able to just walk in newness of life? How do I empower the Holy Spirit? How do I give him more control? How do I fill myself? What are things that I need to give up from me so that they become empty so that I can be filled? That's why we have multiple fillings of the Holy Spirit. So as God points out and say, that's an area that you need to give up, we give it up and then we ask the Spirit of God to come and fill it. I wonder whether there are those things that we need to hand over to Him today so that He can come and fill us. On one hand, just an impoverished Christian life, life of That's our prayer. We pray this prayer in your name. 